Section 4 deals with the identification of risks. Here we will look at financial risks which originate from financial markets, non-financial risks which come from sources other than financial markets, and then the interactions between risks. Financial risks are risks that originate from financial markets. This includes changes in prices and changes in rates. There are three primary types of financial risk. Number one is market risk. Market risk arises from movements in stock prices, interest rates, exchange rates, and commodity prices. Number two is credit risk. Now let's say I buy a bond and the counterparty is supposed to make scheduled coupon payments and scheduled principal payments. The risk of those payments not being made is called credit risk. Sometimes credit risk is also referred to as default risk or counterparty risk. Credit risk occurs in bonds and it can also happen in derivative instruments. In fact, any time a party owes money to another party, the party that is supposed to receive faces credit risk. The third type of financial risk is liquidity risk. This is the risk that as a result of degradation in market conditions or the lack of market participants, one will be unable to sell an asset without lowering the price to less than the fundamental value. So if the fundamental value of an asset is 100, but the only way to sell this in certain market conditions is to bring the price down to 60, then the risk of having to do this is called liquidity risk. It's important to understand the link between liquidity risk and the bid-ask spread. So let's say that a given asset has a bid-ask spread that looks like this. Here, the bid price is 99 and the ask price is 100, which means that if you were to enter the market and you want to buy, you will buy for 100. And if you want to immediately sell, you would be able to sell for 99. The bid ask spread is $1 over here. Now, this can also be thought of as a transaction cost. This in of itself is not a risk. It's simply a cost because the bid ask spread is known. It is possible that the market becomes relatively illiquid. So the risk is that the spread might widen. And a wider spread means that the transaction cost has gone up. Given the link between liquidity risk and the ability to complete a transaction, sometimes liquidity risk is also referred to as transaction cost risk. Non-financial risks come from sources other than financial markets. A major type of non-financial risk is operational risk. This is the risk that arises from within the operations of an organization and includes both human and system or process errors. So for example, if we take a bank context and the teller accidentally credits the wrong amount of money, that is an operational risk. There is this famous case of Nick Leeson of Bearings Bank who in 1995 destroyed the 200-year-old bank by engaging in a series of highly speculative trades to cover up losses. So the risk of something like that happening is also operational risk. The risk of the computer system failing is also operational risk. Next, solvency risk. Solvency refers to the availability of funding to continue to operate without liquidating. And therefore, solvency risk is the risk that an entity does not survive or does not succeed because it runs out of cash to meet its financial obligations. If we consider what happened to Lehman Brothers in 2008, its sources of funding dried up and it did not have the cash to meet its financial obligations. So what we can say is that it went down because of solvency risk. There are several other types of non-financial risks which are shown over here. Settlement risk is related to default risk. If two parties get into, let's say, a forward contract and at the end of the contract, A needs to make a payment and B needs to deliver a bond. 
Now, let's say A makes the payment, but B does not deliver the bond and in fact files for bankruptcy. So, in essence now, A needs to go through a legal procedure and try to get the bond. This might never happen or this whole settlement might be delayed considerably. So, the risk of this settlement not taking place as expected or as planned is called settlement risk. There are multiple types of legal risk. One sort of legal risk for an entity might be that it is sued by another entity and that in turn leads to several legal costs. Another type of legal risk might be where let's say B owes A some money but then finds a legal clause that allows B not to make the payment. The next three items here regulatory risk, accounting risk and tax risk can collectively be referred to as compliance risk and the idea is that there might be a change in tax rules or a change in accounting rules or a change in regulation that has a significant negative impact on an entity. So the risk of that happening would fall under compliance risk. Model risk refers to the risk that a company is using a given model, let's say a valuation model, and there are some mistakes or issues associated with that model. Tail risk has to do with the fact that often many asset returns are modeled as normal distributions. So if we try to calculate the probability of extreme losses based on a normal distribution, the probability might be much lower than what it actually is. So the risk of that happening is tail risk. And then finally, sovereign or political risk is fairly obvious. One might have invested in Greek government bonds, but then due to the euro crisis, the value of those bonds goes down substantially. So the risk of asset values going down because of government related or political problems, that risk is called sovereign or political risk. Note that individuals may face many of the same organizational risks outlined here, but also face health risk, mortality or longevity risk, and property and casualty risk. Now here, health risk refers to unexpected poor health, which means that medical expenses go up and income comes down. Mortality risk is where a person dies and his family then does not benefit from his income. So let's say person X is the main breadwinner for his family, person X dies, then obviously his family does not have income. So the risk of that happening is mortality risk. Longevity risk is the risk that a person, let's say person Y, lives longer than expected. His retirement savings are good enough to serve him till the age of 90, but he lives longer than 90. So the risk of that happening is longevity risk. Property and casualty risk is the risk of property value coming down. We need to recognize that risks are interrelated and in fact many risks arise as a result of other risks. Let's understand this through a simple example. Say we have a bank which has exposure to the market and therefore faces market risk. This bank has made loans to several companies. So let's just say company one, company two and company three. Since the bank has made loans to these companies, the bank also faces credit risk. The link now is that if the market crashes, then chances are that these companies also have exposure to the market and their ability to make payments to the bank will go down, which means that credit risk goes up. So with uncertainty in the market, market risk has gone up and that has also led to an increase in credit risk. If the credit risk goes up, then it is possible that settlement risk will also go up. The next important point is that risk interactions can be non-linear and harmful and in fact the total risk faced is often worse than the sum of the risks of the separate components. In this example, if we separately consider market risk and credit risk, then that does not tell us the full picture. The overall risk faced by the bank will be more than the sum of the parts of market risk and credit risk. 
we can understand this also in a different way say we have company a and another company b which is similar except that company a has no leverage and company b has two times leverage now let's say that there is a loss of one percent here to the non-leveraged firm then for the leveraged firm we might have a two percent loss but what if the loss is ten percent here for the non-leveraged firm then with b the loss is probably going to be more than 20 percent let's say the loss is 25 percent because the cost of servicing debt goes up now if there is a 30 percent loss to company a company b which is two times leveraged might not be able to handle such a big loss because of the toxic interplay between levered risk and liquidity problems so in this situation company b might not have the cash to be able to meet its obligations so this also illustrates the non-linear link between various types of risks for individuals we should consider market risk and human capital risk this can be understood through a simple example let's think about somebody who worked for enron in the 1990s so this person let's say also bought a lot of enron stock as long as enron was doing well he was fine because his salary was slowly increasing and the enron share price was increasing rapidly but what is the risk that he faced the risk was that if enron started performing poorly then his salary would come down and worst case if enron goes out of business then his salary comes down to zero and the enron price will also crash so in this case there is a very high correlation between market risk and human capital risk so as investment advisors we should discourage people from buying stocks in companies where they work because the correlation then between market risk and human capital risk is very high example three financial and non-financial sources of risk which of the following is not a financial risk now we've talked about credit risk market risk and liquidity risk as being financial risks operational risk is not a financial risk which of the following best describes an example of interaction among risks a stock in russia declines at the same time as a stock in japan declines so these two things are happening at the same time so it doesn't really look like an interaction political events cause a decline in economic conditions and an increase in spreads now we would expect that if in country x the political events have deteriorated then the spreads on the bonds issued by that company will widen so this is not really one of the interactions that we've talked about a market decline makes a derivative counterparty less credit worthy while causing it to owe more money on the derivative contract now if we look carefully here there is an allusion to market risk so market decline so this is market risk this causes the counterparty to be less credit worthy which means an increase in credit risk so of the three options this best describes an interaction among different kinds of risks another way of solving questions like this is to look at situations where the link is not completely obvious now in b the link is obvious because we are saying that political events have taken place let's say that there is political turmoil then it is completely expected that the bonds from that country will go down in price and hence credit spreads will increase with a if two things are happening at exactly the same time then that's not really an interaction but c we have two sorts of risks market risk and credit risk that ostensibly are not related but clearly there is an interaction so with c we have two different kinds of risks market risk and credit risk where there is an interaction so this is the best answer which of the following best describes a financial risk 
the risk of an increase in interest rates. Now, this does look like a financial risk. Remember, we talked about changes in rates. So that could be interest rates or exchange rates or changes in prices, which could be stock prices or commodity prices. So this is one of those items, a change in interest rates. The risk that regulators will make a transaction illegal. This falls within the regulatory risk or compliance risk. So it's not a financial risk. The risk of an individual trading without limits or controls. So this falls in operational risk. And therefore, the best answer here is A. Which of the following is not an example of model risk? So this has to do with issues related to the model that we are using. Assuming that tails of a returns distribution are thin when they are in fact fat. So this could be an issue because a model might assume normal distributions, but what we might actually have is a distribution with fat tails. So this is possibly a model risk. Using standard deviation to measure risk when return distribution is asymmetric. So many models do use standard deviation as a measure of risk. But if our assets have a return distribution that's asymmetric, then this is not an appropriate measure. Using the one year risk free rate to discount the face value of a one year government bond. This looks like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So it is probably not an example of model risk. So these are examples of why we might have model risk. C is not an example of model risk. Which of the following is the risk that arises when it becomes difficult to sell a security in a highly stressed market? So this is a classic case of liquidity risk. When it is difficult to sell a security at its fair price, that's called liquidity risk. And that usually happens in stressed market environments. So the best answer here is A. The final question, the risks that individuals face based on mortality create which of the following problems? The risk of loss of income to their families. So that's the answer. And this is just a definition. Mortality risk means that we have a breadwinner in a family, the breadwinner dies, and then the problem is for the family, which now does not have a breadwinner. So that's mortality risk shown here. B, covariance, risk associated with their human capital and their investment portfolios. So that is a risk where somebody is working at a company, so relies on salary from the company and has invested in that company. So that is a risk, but that's not mortality risk. The interacting effects of solvency risk and the risk of being taken advantage of by an unscrupulous financial advisor. So this might be a risk, but again, it's not based on mortality.